Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Agent Boost podcast. On set with us today, we've got one of our, our Medicare Advocates team leads and great agent Sean Sieverts, as well as my brother, Dan. Toss it over to you, Dan. Ready to go? <laughs> ready to go. We're <laughs> ready to go. All right. So, hey, hey. We, we wanted to bring on Sean, and what you're probably going to see from us is not necessarily a showcase, but we really want to bring on, um, you know, we feel that our listeners, a lot of agents out there, there's going to be a lot of relatability, things that you guys can definitely go, yes, I that resonates with me a ton. So we wanted to start kind of bringing on some of our agents that are, have been great partners for years, and, and Sean is certainly one of them. So... So Sean, one of the reasons why we wanted to highlight him is Sean has been an agent that was able to escape the W-2 mass enrollment center, call center, and convert to a very, very successful independent agent and is now one of our team leads. So I think his story is very interesting and intriguing to a lot of you out there that are trying to make that same transition. Yeah, and one of the things that we'll, we'll be talking, asking you about grilling you about a little bit, Sean, is yeah. we talk to agents on a very regular basis, whether they're at call center A or B or C or Satan's call center or whoever. Or Joe Namath's where, call center. Wherever you're at, there's agents we talk to all the time yeah. that want to flee or they think like, hey, I I wrote 900 sales last enrollment season at this call center and I'm going to go be an independent agent. I got my math. I got my pencil out. I added up the numbers of what independent agents make and I'm going to go write 900 apps as an independent agent, you know, just like I was in that big call center. Um, and, and that math does not always equate. It's not the same, same. And I think you've kind of gone through that transition of leaving the call center, having success. And it, it's just been much different than what people probably think it's going to be would you agree yeah with that for sure for sure sean first start why don't you start and give us your three minute backstory leading into medicare and how right. you ended up looking into aligning with us years yeah. ago so i was i was working for a mortgage lender and then i saw some google ad i think it was to work for a call center doing medicare i had no idea really what medicare was other than insurance but it was promising six figures for anyone qualified so i applied and turned down a pretty good job at Zions Bank that I was in the running for. So I, I were you going to be a myself. bank teller? Yeah, could have, would have, should have. It was uh, something in the treasury management, but <laughs> it was all good. So I went there and I decided I I chose this path. I have to go all in. So I surrounded myself with all the other top agents. Soaked everything in that I could. I remember recording phone calls between their top agents and the clients and just listening to that to and from in training. And I just applied myself as much as I could. And the goal was to be among the top of my training group. And I became number one for the floor for seven or eight months in a row. And then realized the shady things that were going on, the bait and switch leads, and saw my path out. And then started our own agency with another couple uh, so managers. Your own insurance so agency? It was yeah. kind of, yeah. 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 So how how long were you at the, so you, the you first got, one. You got the into the one. industry, you know, working, which a lot of people do. The, by the way, this is very, very, very normal. Yeah. Um, you got into the industry working for uh, a call center. How long were you there at the first call center? Uh, it was like nine or ten months. Okay. I did really well. The first AP... Sold. What year was that? 2016? 2015. 2015. Yeah. Okay. okay. So then you started your own, I always forget about your own. So four, yeah. Four A. Two friends, coworkers that were starting their own Medicare brokerage uh -huh. under a lead generation company. And they were kind of skimming the cream off the top, giving the best leads to those agents. And it was good while we were there. I was there for. That never happens in the year industry, and a half. does it? Yeah. 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 So. Did well. We grew that team to 30. I was the first agent there, grew it to 30, and then that was bought out, and then we were all out of a job. So I kind of got burned twice <laughs> in the Medicare <laughs> space. So you're like, let me go get another job in the Medicare industry. No, so I, I got out. I went into software sales. That was like 2017 that I was like, done with Medicare. It's not for me. You Did thought. software so sales you thought. Yeah. for a year. Yeah. Software gig was pretty cool, but didn't pay as well as Medicare. So found myself getting reached out to by previous people and found myself at another call center. 
it was a different story, but the same same thing. Same was this the story. the one that you were at for a while? The large yeah one that everybody knows their name yeah. Okay. Two. How long were you there? He's there. I was like 2018, 2019. Okay. And then. Hey, how many? 2020 came here. How many enrollments were you writing in a year there? Not just like AEP, but in a year at that other entity. I would say 13 to 1400. 13 to 1400. Okay. I was like 120, 130 during lock in. So, so at the time that we. First cross paths, basically the, the, let me lay the backstory for you. So the situation was pre COVID. I think this was early 2020, 2020, right? Like right at 2020. And that particular call center had just really kind of changed the, uh, was post them going public and they were kind of changing some things and they kind of had some commission issues where a common thing with agents that we saw at this time is agents would get their front end commission and then a back end. And usually because of attrition and accretion and things yeah. like that and disenrollments was never quite, agents never quite got what they thought they were getting on this right. back end yeah. after OEP, right? Yeah. So this was a particularly bad instance with this. There was a lot of uh, um, a culling there for this particular call center. And we just being in Salt Lake City, if you don't happen to know this, we export a couple of things, door-to-door sales companies and call centers. Mm-hmm. So we got basically, if there's a call and center. Any and uh, any other MLM, like Sensi Oils or whatever else, we're also the That's true. Company. We're always slinging stuff. Whatever yeah, you got, we, whenever you need, we got you here. Yeah. Amway, I mean, it's anything that's a pyramid scheme, it's absolutely. Yeah, so we'd always been looking at kind of doing a hybrid better version of a cost because we knew that you could reach a lot of people. We knew that it was the technology was kind of coming into scale. So you were part of this big culling of agents who had just left and they were all, you all kind of like banded together and were looking to kind of group up and do an agency type thing. Right. Yeah. I feel like there wasn't a ton of people that left before I did. And I feel like I, there was a domino effect, but. So when you left, it was, it wasn't just like, Let's toot your own horn a little bit here. It wasn't just like a random, you know, one of the mill guys. You were like the guy, right? You were the blonde haired, blue eyed poster child of success for, uh, for this company, right? Yeah. I had really good, really good retention issue rates. All that was really good. But yeah, you still just had so many fall off because they're getting hounded by calls and they just switch for any given reason. And I was making good money, but I knew the money I made in 2019 was going to be probably 30%, 40% less just with how they restructured the commission and everything else. And I knew my NPN was on the line with every one of those deals I wrote. So complaints, it all just falls back on me, not the company. Yeah. So, so that was one of your, I I remember that being one of your main hesitations was you felt like you're, you know, the economies of scale were there and just by nature of how many enrollments you were doing, you were kind of the the NPN shield for this big entity taking all these enrollments. And I think you're, you know, now that those enrollments probably weren't always the most thorough or the most compliant. It was a little bit of the wild, wild West and not to single out this particular call center because a lot of them were kind of operating like that, mostly just like enrollment mills. Right. And, and, and and people would wear it like a badge of honor, right? Kind of like I did 700 during open enrollment. And you're like, do you even have the time to do a proper needs analysis and ask the right, right questions and put them on the right plan. The answer is no. I mean, I think that if you were murdering it during AEP, you could write three to 500 if you were absolutely crushing it. But yeah. to write more than that, you probably aren't really adequately spending time with the consumer, right? Yeah, I would guess. Yeah, and we knew now it was just, you know, the spaghetti against the wall, trying to see what sticks and what's left over. And so you, uh, besides that, and it was the... the the potential risk of your license being in jeopardy and the commissions. What else did you not like about that particular way of doing it or environment? Uh, I guess just how rigid it was. There's no flexibility with your work schedule. So taking time off was hard to come by. I just, I knew I wanted the flexibility and the freedom to own the book and be able to. How much time were you working, for example, during an AEP? Yeah. OEP, lock in AEP. Uh, AP was probably 7 a.m. to at least 7 p.m., if not 8 p.m. 
12, 13 hours a day. So every day. 70 hours a week. Yeah, yeah, probably 12 to 14 hours a day on average. And then yeah. OEP, 8 to 10 hours. I don't, I don't work crazy, crazy over OEP. And then lock-in is just your 8 hours every day. So 40 hours. So you were working most of the year. You're working 40-hour weeks. During, you know, we'll call it annual enrollment, you were working 70-hour weeks. Yeah. And then during OEP, you were working probably 50-hour weeks. Yeah. And I think the last week of, you know, Last week, first week of December, last week of AP, it was 120 hours or something. It was 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day or 10 p.m. Yeah. It's crazy. So when you left, there was part of this big uh, exodus of agents at the time. And a lot of you that left were basically some of the top producing agents in the whole country. So it was kind of a little bit of a, a dust up for sure. Um, out of those first 30 agents, be now tell me about your consideration. So for some of you, you were a little bit hesitant to to come over and go independent. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about your your mindset and your decision making process. So it was then. it was tough. I was making great money. I knew it was a dead end. I just didn't know when, and I didn't know if I needed to ride it out longer and then make the switch. And I just had something in my gut tell me, no, now's the time to go. And I talked with you and vetted you and Dan out a little bit more and it was kind of you trusting me I had somewhat of a reputation you said we'll do everything we can to make you successful and here's all the tools we give you here's all the leads and everything else and I I just knew I had to bet on myself and just go all in kind of like I did the first time and it, it's totally worked out yeah so there was a little bit more uh hesitation yes on, he, on that yeah. i definitely he drilled me for sure had to um deploy some of my better sales skills in convincing this fine young man to come over yeah. close the deal and, yeah, yeah close the deal because you know and and i was really hesitant too because i i knew how much you were making and i know you know getting going as an independent it's probably a step back to take some steps forward you know and so oh, yeah. it's usually a year or two to really replace that and then you kind of move above and beyond that so I didn't want to oversell you on the opportunity either right. but I finally was just like I well, think, well here's, here's I think you were underselling it and I kind of could catch that a little bit well so. I think the other thing that happens though too is I mean you're right whenever we're talking to agents out there and they are going well I'm already making x so I will take this risk and I will come over and take this chance but it's only if it's all upside and I'm going to make more than I currently am and it just doesn't work that way. Like usually yeah. it's, hey, you're, you might, you're, you're going to have to go through this pain for a year to three years, whatever that period is. If you ever want to have trajectory above where you're at and grow and be in a different situation, you're going to have to go through some period of time of pain or sacrifice or whatever in order to have that better outcome. Yeah. And, and you were willing to do it. So, I mean, kudos yeah. to you. But a lot of... Agents out there are just like, well, no, I'm making $100,000 a year right now. And if this doesn't immediately be a better opportunity than what I currently have, I'm not doing it. And that's why people don't win a lot of times. Yeah. You know? What, what is it that I, I ultimately said that got you to make the move? Do I just, you remember? I trusted that when you said, Sean, I don't know what else I can tell you. We've gone over this backwards and forwards. I'll do whatever, everything I can to make you successful. We have enough to provide, so yeah, I'll help take it under my wing type of thing. For me, it's been so. really cool to see that risk pay off because Sean's been one of our team leads, and he's you know I I really think he's one of our shining successes. He's done it the right way. He he re kind of taught himself. I let him get into that about going into the industry, but now Sean's you know made some good decisions. He's building a big nice new house. Not that this all matters or this is the be all end all, but he's building a big nice new house right by me. And I'm just really, really proud of you. So yeah, it's thanks. cool to highlight you and and see uh, your success. But it's all on you, man. We just provided the, you know, the infrastructure and the background. But you, yeah. you really did all that yourself. Yeah, I had people when I first started at the first call center tell me all the time they would like feed my ego and like, dude, you're killing it here. You can be successful anywhere you go. You just you have that about you. And I hadn't really experienced that up to that point. And I didn't even know if I trusted that it would work out here exactly like when I first started. So it was cool because the first several months, five months, I wasn't selling nearly what I was used to selling. Commissions weren't as much as prorated throughout the year, right? So starting in July, August, 
didn't sell a ton before AEP. And then as soon as AP hit, I was starting to put in a lot of deals and you're not getting paid on that till January, but I knew the money was coming. And as soon as that January hit, it was, yeah, full steam ahead. It was, it was a rough six months. Huh? Yeah. First a little bit. Six months. Yeah. So, so just to kind of give some more background on that at that time, Dan and I had been wanting to go virtual for a while and we as had already started building in tools for our agents because we started seeing the industry changing a little bit where seniors were becoming a little bit more uh, comfortable doing business. You know, they were ordering stuff on Amazon. They were talking to people on Facebook. They, they didn't really care if you came down and shook their hand at a kitchen table. Sometimes these seniors just wanted to get it done quickly and efficiently yeah. from a guy that was an expert. And like I said, we here in Salt Lake City have always had in Utah have always had a really high caliber, a high acumen of agent and so we were looking for ways to for our agents to be able to fish in bigger ponds outside of just the state of Utah because, for example, there's more beneficiaries in Houston, Texas than there are in the entire state of Utah. And so right. we were trying to find a way to leverage good, talented agents and not necessarily go a full call center model because we really wanted our, our clients to still have an agent that was their agent that they could call and get a hold of and trust and really know and be an expert in the field. So we were trying to build this blended hybrid model that yeah. we've really continued today. We weren't just trying to rip off and build a, a, you know, a me too version of some of these Medicare enrollment centers. Right. And you bought into that vision yeah. and early on, um, how many of the, that, of that first crop that kind of left with you is still with us a decent chunk, right? Still, Five still cranking seven, away. Probably. Yeah. Yes. yes. And usually what happens is, and it happened then was, you know, half of those people figured right away that they were not necessarily cut out for yeah. the solo journey themselves to be that entrepreneur and this had the self motivation. And well, well, it's, it's a, it's a steep thing. Like I, we try to explain it to people all the time though, too, is when you're in a call center environment, you have adherence for like everything, right? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you aren't on cue, if you're not handling calls, like you, I think you get a margin of about anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes in the day overall that if you're not handling, answering inbound phone calls or making outbounds, like you're off of adherence. I mean, it is like raise the hand to go to the bathroom. It's very tightly ran. And yeah. so I think there's not ability for a lot of people to make decisions. And so when they go into being independent, there's you go from this very structured, rigid environment to there's no, there's none of that. And it's pretty much, it's all up to that person to hold themselves accountable and, you know, show up on time, put in the work, do everything. And that's a pretty steep transition. And that's the biggest reason why most people go from those environments and then go to be an independent and don't make it. It's not that they don't have the aptitude. It's not that they don't have the skills to do it. It's yep. just, they don't have the self-discipline to kind of make it work. Yeah. You know, that that's how, you know, to the point of, of talking a little bit earlier about how some of these agents aren't willing to kind of take a step back to take a step forward. I, I have that conversation every week, almost every day with people that are at that point in their life. And we're seeing in the economy right now, guys, we're seeing a bunch of like kind of just over six figure type income earners that feel a little bit stuck, but they almost, it's that frog in boiling water analogy where they're making enough that they're not happy with it. It's not the life that they wanted, but they can't get off that. They don't really have enough financial flexibility and latitude to or honestly willingness to go suffer and suck and make a little bit less money for a year or two, like we just said. It can be humbling. Yeah, sure. in yeah. order to go propel themselves forward because you you have to do that at some point, you know? And um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, we, we do have quite a few of the agents that initially left with you. I, as I'm thinking about it, a lot of those are some of our core virtual agents. Talk to me and some of the anybody that might be listening. What are some of the things that you like about being a virtual agent? You know, selling Medicare versus you having to go, you know, face to face all the time. I didn't really do any face to face, so it's nice virtually that you can get a ton in front of a ton of people without I, having to. I'm going to jump in here. I think it. I think we should make. We're everybody. asking you to kind of like sell we, the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. No, I think. <laughs> I think we should like make them all yeah. have like a, a low income D snip lead in a trailer park with cats. I think everybody should, yeah. that should be like a rite of passage or something for everybody to go have some of those in home appointments first. Yeah. We're going to start getting you some know. agents on and sharing, uh, 
worst in-home oh, appointment yeah. with chain experiences. Yeah, 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 yeah. Piss and everything else, but yeah. All right. So, so what so do you? But what do you like about it? So you know? the volume of mm-hmm. sales you can get, it's it's you can never match that with only in-person appointments. And then it's you're quicker on the phone. You're more efficient with your time. You can talk to people all over the country, all within a short amount of time. Yeah. So let me, um, you know, kind of hop in and tell some, cause some of these agents are like, Oh yeah, but my retention, you know, w- one of the things that we've seen is a good agent like Sean, a good yeah. virtual agent he does. And I'll let him talk about some of the things yeah. he does for retention and building rapport, you know, virtually and with an avatar and building trust and stuff like that. But the retention is not that much further off than what it is with a field agent. If you're a good virtual agent, but the volume, like he's talking about, that you can sell a lot of times is is much easier. And our kind of model and what we coach and what Sean's done is we kind of coach agents. You probably can't be, you're not going to be an expert in all 50 states, right? But pick, Yeah. I mean, you are licensed in a lot of states and you know, or you've been doing this for a long time. So you're kind of the exception a little bit, but we kind of tell agents learn 10 to 15, 20-ish states really kind of focus on states maybe that aren't these big, massive, gigantic cluster metros and become an expert and really learn what the nuances of those areas are like, what the The, networks, the hospital network. Yeah. The hospital networks, the the demographics, what plans people like and what are happy, you know, the good market. So you can actually add value as a virtual agent. You're not just a, a human enrollment button that's calling and like looking on a piece of paper or looking at Sunfire or whatever the tool they're using and just kind of, you, you learn quite a bit about those, those industries. So what are some of the things that you've done to ingratiate retention and rapport with your clients? So for me, I noticed quickly that you have to, it's more about you and selling yourself as much as it is the plan, right? Cause if they aren't happy, if they're not satisfied, they're going to quickly jump to something else as soon as they hear about it. So I do make sure I tell my clients, I'm your agent for life. I'm here for you. Write my number down. I make them get a pen and paper out, do that at the end of the call. And then as soon as we end the call, I use Sunfire to send out a, like a post enrollment campaign, a retention campaign. It sends in my digital postcard. Use our Rocket, CRM, right? Yeah. CRM. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Our Sorry. CRM. Yeah, yeah. The CRM. So it sends them all my info, contact info. It says, save this in your phone. And then it does a drip campaign. So after about 10 days, to two weeks, it says you should be getting your card soon. If you haven't already, this is what that's for. The plan starts next month and everything else. It just, it's it like a 3, 30, 60, 90 day campaign. Yeah. Right? It's mm-hmm. a little bit more heavy the first month. Like it's like three yep. different things the first month and then it kind of slows drips down. It out, slows it, down. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but it, as soon as I do that, I also do a handwritten postcard in a colored envelope and everything. So they see it, they get that in the mail, they put it on their fridge with a magnet. Who does that fulfillment for you? I tend to do it during the summer months when it's hotter out and then AEP, OEP, I have the fulfillment team do it. And they our, send, our they fulfillment send, team, right? Yeah, so they send chocolates. I'm just giving a plug right there. We have a <laughs> internal fulfillment to send this out for our virtual team. Yeah. Chocolates or a pen. So much better because I don't want to take the time to do all that myself. It's such right. a nice. So, so to kind of sketch it, and this is, you know, to kind of explain the model too, because I've had agents say, well, yeah, but your call center agents are only retaining things at 70% or something like that. And it's like, well, field agents are only retaining at 80 to 85%. But if you have a field agent that works year round, a traditional way and windshield time and local marketing and, and they go write 150 apps in a year and they retain, you know, 80% of them. I will take a rep that writes 450 apps and retain 70%. Just do the math. It's, yeah. it's very easy math to do. It's a much better model. And so, and I do find that you, you've probably increased your retention by doing that, that contact point, you know, a traditional agent goes and writes a policy for somebody. They meet them, they meet them face to face what's their contact after that? Yeah. For most agents, yeah. it's nothing. Maybe a letter yeah. before AEP and that's it. And so I think the one thing that we've been able to do very well is build that into a better experience for somebody, even though the agent, they never meet them in person, they're over the phone. By the time they actually get that 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 message from you at day three, at day 30, at day 60, you're, you're yeah. having those touch points. You're saying, hey, I'm your agent, contact me. I think it's still building a better experience than what a lot of people get from their yeah. face-to-face agents to be candid with. Yeah. You. And I'll, I'll run campaigns throughout the year. If I'm getting a lot of feedback from current clients, like Sean, I keep hearing about this or that or the other thing. I'll then say, okay, I need to blast a campaign really quick to all my current clients. Hey guys, I keep getting a lot of this feedback. Just be aware of X, Y, Z and 
call me if you need me and what's disregard your, this. So what's your nice. retention rate that you shoot for? And what have you, where was it before and how much of an increase have you seen since you started focusing on trying to retain more members? I think for the whole year, my retention's close to 80%, 78 to 80. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was, I don't even know exactly. You guys might know better than I before. About 8%. But off that maybe I don't yeah. know like below, right below seventy so you've increased it by about ten percent yeah which is a pretty big actually a big jump you know candidly when you start modeling that out over a three and a five year period it is huge the, the revenues from that yeah for sure so yeah so there's there's a couple of things that you know we've been able to help our agents with if you prefer to sell you know virtually. Uh, a lot of our tools, the tech, of course, you know, they're sending everything, but one of the, they're sending all the required documents, a text message, a business card that looks professional. We've crafted a brand. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but Agent Boost owns Medicare Advocates. And so if you, we built a brand that looks very, very uh, credible. We spent a lot of money developing it. We have a lot of Google reviews, things like that, that we have our virtual agents and team use. Um, so it's kind of an in-the-box model there. Um, one of the other things that I like about selling virtually is all your eggs aren't in one basket necessarily, right? We we see this increasingly all the time where agents have, you know, they're, they sell one product yeah. in one market very specifically. And if there's ever any big turmoil in that, you know, their entire book of business is in jeopardy or they've got to spend an entire AEP, you know, salvaging or maintaining their business. And when you're diversified like that, you know, you've got a, a healthy mix of a different portfolio of characters spread across the country, you're, you're very indemnified against massive turmoil, right? Yep. You can always identify which of your policyholders are at risk, so to speak, or you might say, hey, I've got a thousand clients and 52 of them are going to be SARS or plan exits. But then I have, you know, another hundred or 200 that are on these weaker plans. There are two and a half stars or three stars or this carrier lost a Medicaid contract or whatever it might be. So you're always going to have like your at risk people, but you're not going to have the kind of a situation where you have a block of a thousand clients all in one place. And suddenly you have a season where you're going to have to rewrite 750 policies, you know, which is we actually have agents right now in that situation that are in a lot of turmoil because they are up against 60, 70 hour work weeks for this whole enrollment season. And they don't even know if they're going to, walk away making more money than what they're currently currently collecting. Yeah, one or two uh, bad plan decisions that you have no effect over uh, and a market exit or something like that, and you're spending your whole AEP just trying to keep what you have, right? Yeah. So uh, give us, um, before we wrap up, Sean, give us some, some advice to an agent who's been in a call center-like environment and they want to go independent, they do want to make that. What advice would you give to them to make that transition work? Um, I would say go all in hundred percent. And if you can bet on yourself and really be a student of the, of, of the work and the ethic and everything you got to do to be successful. Um, there's a lot of support and team members around you and team leads that you can reach out to. But if you put in the work and the effort, I think anyone can be successful doing this virtually and independent. So, you, so talk to that too, Sean. We've we've just been talking about these yeah. groups. We we plucked you as a poster child, yeah, to put you on this podcast as somebody who has right. succeeded. You've been here for what th- four years now? Three years, three, three and a half, yeah, three and a half years. And I would say you're kind of a made man at this point. Three and a half years in, right? Yeah. Doing yep. this, um, you you're making more income now than you ever did in any of those other roles. Correct. Correct. Three and a half years in, you spent how many years doing Medicare in different call centers? Six, seven, eight years. Uh, yeah, I've been doing this for about nine years, but selling Medicare. Four or five years at a call center, five or six. But three years with us now, and you've already are making more money than you had any of those previous gigs, right? And the trajectory for next year is you're going to make even more money than you are this year, which is great. But why did you succeed? And why did your other kind of peers and people who exit at the same time not succeed? I think I had a good, um base knowledge of Medicare, everything I needed to do as far as knowing the products, knowing how to sell. I was very disciplined in my approach. And then I think the biggest thing is just whoever can 
keep at it the longest and and ride the roller coaster because it's not always going to be easy. Well, I, uh, I have something I something know. to add. I'll tell you why you made it. Okay? Yeah, I was going to say. Okay. Um, two, number one, your work ethic, right? Your your just willingness to show up and go all in and bet on yourself and put the work in consistently for sure. Even and especially in the earlier days when it was, you know, because we were grinding a lot of times on like age leads and Facebook leads and stuff like that. That wasn't always as easy as it is now. And you, you, the other thing is you bought in and you trusted the model. And I think we had a good model. And we had a good idea of what it was. And I was grateful that you and a couple of the others really bought in and kind of trusted me because at that time I was, I was like, Hey, I've, I got to prove this thing works. I got to prove that this yeah. is that we can do it like this and sell at a high volume. Right. And so, you know, I was, I was in there, uh, cranking away with everybody else, but you, your work ethic, your attitude, and the fact that you bought in and just kind of yeah. trusted and went all in, I really think differentiated. And then of course you are a great, a great sales rep. Yeah. You're, you are very, and like, you can't worry about the things that are out of your control. You can only focus and worry about what's in your in your control. And so that's that's where I put all my time and effort into is how can I be more creative? How can I reach out to more people? What campaigns can I run? How can I attract more people coming to me? Mm -hmm. Get my fishing net even bigger, attract that's, more people. And that's what um, I was going to speak to, Sean. I was going to say the reason that I perceive that you've been successful is that you have accountability for your success. Whereas I think... There's always going to be external factors, and I always tell everybody this, that, you know, plans are going to screw up their bids. They're going to have bad benefits. They're going to have to sunset a plan. Carriers are going to screw up commissions. They Guess what? They screw up commissions sometimes. Yeah. They're going to mess up all kinds of things, and what I have always tell people is they're very – they're not very mentally, they don't have fortitude. It's like the first challenge or two that presents their way, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm done for. You know, like after they've had three or four or five hiccups or bumps in the road, they're just done. And so I think that's been the biggest factor too is being able to push through all those things, whether it's maybe agent boost screwed something up, maybe the carrier didn't pay you right, or the fact that you've always been able to say, hey, how can I still push forward and find a way to make this work is probably the biggest difference. Yeah. Yeah. So you're one of our team leaders on our virtual on our Medicare advocates team. And so what that means is Sean, instead of doing like a traditional GA or MGA structure, which is kind of like antiquated in a lot of aspects of the industry, we have a different structure um, where Sean has agents on his team that he helps um, teach, train and develop and gets a, a small override on those agents as well in perpetuity. From that experience, Sean, what do you see when we have new agents placed with you or you brought new agents in, why do some of those not make it? And why do some of them make it? What do you, what's your perspective there? It's going back to kind of what we just talked about. A lot of them get overwhelmed with things that they can't control and they try to nitpick different things of, Oh, we should be doing this or that, or it's not working because of X, Y, and Z. And they make too many excuses and they always have something going on that, that takes away their momentum. And it's tough to just keep them completely engaged and just trust the process and keep their head down and keep working. I also would notice and say that in general, people aren't very patient these days. I, I, I would say as a trend, I tell everybody insurance is the best get rich slow scheme ever created. And I've said that many times you get rich very slowly, you know, and, and people don't recognize that you're very successful until you've been in the business for 10 or 15 or 20 years. And by the time you're, cash in massive checks. They're like, oh yeah, I want to be doing that too. And it's like, yeah, all you got to do is work really hard for 20 years and you'll be doing it too. Um, they don't have the patience to do it. And I yeah. think that's the other thing. People get into it from a job to this. And within the first two or three months, they're going through contracting, they're going through training, they're going through all this pain. And they're not even patient enough to wait for the, the opportunity to develop. I would, I would say. That's the other thing. Yeah. I think, you know, we, we just, pretty much beat this topic over the head on every podcast, but it's putting in that work and that effort. And, you know, a lot of agents, they get into this, they, they want to, you know, if they want to sell virtually, essentially get on the phone, they call for one hour and they're like, Oh, I'm out. Sorry. That didn't, that didn't work. This sucks. Right. And, uh, one hour. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, you know, we, we've, we've had through. agents. We've, we've had agents too. We talked to, right. And we've all had these meetings, even as a team lead where we bring on all these new people and we were like, 
you know, you get everything set up from like their, your contracting team does everything. They spend all these hours pushing out. They do contracts. The agent sits there and does certifications for nine different carriers. Does all these certs. Yeah. You know, we, we build in their custom profiles and their CRMs. We build their profile in Sunfire. We get leads to street. We do all this stuff. They and attend every Zoom call. Yeah, there's, there's thousands yeah. of dollars and time spent into developing this rep. And now they're ready to go. And you're like, okay, go. And they're like, Oh yeah, I, I made thirteen phone calls, and someone told me to jump off a bridge. I'm not doing this anymore. Like, yeah. You did realize that this was a sales job over the phone that we've been telling you about for four months. You realize this, right? Yeah, it's it's in my training. I have a segment where I say, "Tonight, I want you to go home, and I want you to look yourself in the mirror, and I want you to say, am I willing to make a bunch of dials and eat a bunch of crap and take a bunch of rejection continually? Am I built for that?" Or is that going to crush my soul and I'm not going to make those calls and I can't handle any rejection? Because if the answer is, no, I'm not made for that, you might as well just... And there, hey, there is no shame yeah. in it either. Like I tell everybody this all the time. There's no shame in it. This is a hard business. It's hard to do mentally. Look, there's jobs out there that are hard physically, digging trenches, you know, doing, you know, tile work. I mean, there's so many roofers. I mean, there's so many jobs out there where people are, are you know, having to exert themselves in all these other ways. Sales over the phone is mentally hard and challenging and you have to have all this discipline and you have to have the right psyche and hype yourself up and get over all the rejections and everything. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do. It's just not for everybody. Yeah, and, yeah. and to be fair on our virtual, one of the things I think is cool about our virtual program is, I mean, you're not necessarily just grinding away as a telemarketer the whole time. You've been yeah, really good. Talk yeah. about that. So there are people here that just call all day long and they do well. They'll get, they'll get a lot of sales. I've had the approach more of how can I be creative with the campaigns that we run to attract more people to come to me, and then my phone's ringing, and then it's just about calling people back that I missed and answering inbound calls, and I don't make a ton of outbound calls in a day. Right. It might be 20, 25, and, yep. but and, a lot and of it's inbound. And before I have 20 agents listening to this, they're like, oh, I'm going to report agent boost for unsolicited contact. <laughs> No. When we're talking about outbound calls, it's leads provided from carriers. Yeah. It's leads that we've actually purchased where people have specifically opt in and followed every single protocol, you know, where it's very compliant. So before 20 of you listening to this, miss going, us with that going, you know, right. zing, I'm going to report these guys for bad business practices. Not the case. Right. But, um, so before we run out and, of time, and you have a book of business now too, that you're marketing to, yeah. right. And getting yeah. leads and all that as yeah. well. Yeah. And I started Great. tracking referrals. I'm amazed at how many referrals I get a year. It's, Pretty cool. So I always ask agents this too before we run out of time. Get, do you have any good stories? I I like storytelling. I have a lot of good stories in the business, whether it be agents, consumers. I have lots of good stories. If you catch me at a bar late at night, three drinks in, you'll hear some of these great stories. But um, Sean, I always ask people high point, low point. Do you have any great stories in the business where like you just left the day feeling like, man, this is like the best ever. I'm just. I'm blessed, like life couldn't get any better because of like an interaction or experience you yeah. had. And then also like your worst day ever where you're just like, oh, I, I want to quit now immediately. Oh man. Um, I have those good stories a lot. People that just go on for five, 10 minutes telling me how great I am and how I've lived up to everything that their friend told me, told them about me or whatever for, for referrals. But there's been some stories for sure where they're more funny than they are bad, I would say. I had old lady confess that she had some neighbor's dog come on her lawn, and she hit it with a shovel and killed this person's dog. <laughs> and she's going on for like 10 minutes about the story, and I'm like, lady, this is not the time or place. You're, and back like, to uh, review. Uh, by the way, this is like, a recorded call. Remember? You know, yeah. um, by the yeah. way, um, which medications are you taking exactly. currently? Yeah. Now, there's a lot of fun stories out there, and people really need the help. They're appreciative, and if you're a good agent, they're going to refer you left and right. And we do gift cards now. Like We can send them gift cards, and they just eat that stuff up, and they just send you more and more. And people that were referred to you hear that Susie's got a gift card for referring them, so now they refer others. And Remember, you can't be based snowballs. on the promise of a referral. You know, right? Yeah. It's, right? It's, yeah. Or contingent on Contingent upon, right? Yep, not contingent upon. Got all these rules to follow. Right. Yeah, guys. And hey, Sean. Thank you. You've yeah. been a great success story in our mind. Appreciate you sharing your wisdom. And so for all of you agents out there that are trying to make that transition, 
uh, the answer is not. It's a get rich quick sw- scheme. And to Dan's earlier point, if you were doing five, six, seven hundred enrollments, that company that you were working for was spending a lot of money to make that phone ring so you could hit that enrollment button over and over again. But the sales work and getting in front of the prospect has to be made some way, right? And sometimes that's through our own efforts, or you're paying a lot of money for someone else to do that for you. Yeah. Before we before we close the book on this, Sean, any last words? Your time to shine. Not really. Not you don't even want to give like a recruiting pitch if anyone's like interested out there, huh? Hit, hit you up, join your team. Yeah, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there no. you go. It's, yeah, for yeah, for me, I'll just say it's been the best of what you could have for from a call center with the leads provided, the support, everything paid for, the CRM, the phone software, everything, and the best of the both worlds with being independent and the flexibility, but also owning your book of business and growing that for yourself. So that's my pitch. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Catch you guys later.